that are really foundational. You see, chapter 6, section 1, begins with George Washington. George Washington setting up and heading and running this new government. Uh, now, as President Washington, no longer general, no longer presiding officer at the Constitutional Convention, now United States President George Washington uh, was very transformational in forming the ideas of the Constitution into a real and functioning government. Now the very first concept we're going to look at is the Judiciary Act of 1789. This law passed by Congress created the U.S. Supreme Court as well as the entire judicial system. Now the U.S. Constitution laid out the framework for a judicial system, and it was this law that put it into motion, creating the United States Supreme Court. It is the job of the U.S. Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution. It is the job of the U.S. Supreme Court to be the final hearing of any case in our country. They are the highest court of the land. State court decisions can be appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And this, of course, formed the judicial branch of our government. Now, the executive branch. This was generally formed and organized by George Washington and his cabinet. When Washington was elected the first president of the United States in 1789, he and his vice president were the first chief executives of our new nation. There was no president from 76 until 89. And now we have a president. Now we have a leader. And so Washington got to pick his first advisors, but Congress created the first cabinet positions. The Office of State, the Office of War, and Treasury. Alexander Hamilton became the first Secretary of the Treasury. In fact, it was his financial plan for the government that is going to create the first Bank of the United States. George Washington also created an Attorney General, a Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the country, and these department heads are the very first cabinet, the very first formal advisors to the President of the United States. Following the, guidelines Following the guidelines that were written in the new Constitution, George Washington of Virginia was elected to be the first President of the United States of America, and John Adams of Massachusetts was chosen to be his Vice President. Two months after his election, George Washington, at the age of 57, was inaugurated President. He was about to begin the extraordinarily difficult task of leading the world's only democracy, a type of government that hadn't been tried for a very long time. In fact, democracy had succeeded just once, and that was for a brief time back in ancient Greece. In 1789, the year Washington was elected, U.S. territory extended from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River, far beyond the boundaries of the original 13 colonies. Even so, most of North America was not under the control of the United States, for to the north in Canada lay territory controlled by Great Britain, while to the south and west lay territory mostly claimed by Spain. America's nearly four million citizens were spread over a very wide area and the new federal government would serve to unify them all. It would collect taxes, regulate and oversee certain activities of their states, and it would also defend them in times of war. America's first president was a man very much beloved by the citizens of his country. He was a brave man who had led the Continental Army to victory over the British in the War for Independence. And he was a highly respected political leader 
who had presided over the convention that drew up the U.S. Constitution. Before Washington could start to carry out his duties as president, the United States Congress had to do two very important things required of it by the Constitution, and that were essential to a properly functioning national government. The first was to establish the executive departments. These were the departments of state, treasury, and war that were to be directly under the president's control. The second was to establish the federal court system that Congress created by passing the Judiciary Act of 1789. One of Washington's first jobs as president was to appoint the people who would head these newly created departments. He chose Thomas Jefferson, minister to France during the Revolutionary War, to be his Secretary of State. Jefferson would deal with the nation's relations with foreign countries. Alexander Hamilton, a trusted military aide during the Revolution, was chosen to be his Secretary of the Treasury. Hamilton would deal with the nation's financial matters. Henry Knox, a Revolutionary War hero, was selected to be his Secretary of War. Knox would oversee the nation's defense. The heads of the three executive departments were the president's closest personal advisors and made up his first presidential cabinet. Furthermore, President Washington nominated John Jay, a prominent lawyer and figure in New York politics, to be Chief Justice of the new Supreme Court, the nation's highest court. And as Washington continued to choose people to serve in the federal government, James Madison, United States Representative from Virginia, proposed ten amendments to the new Constitution called the Bill of Rights that were designed to safeguard personal freedoms. Now, from the very beginning of our country, there was a division. And we've been discussing this division throughout Chapter 5, the anti-federalist versus the federalist. The federalist who believed in a strong central government maintaining a balance of power between the states and the federal government. Um, and this idea was championed by Alexander Hamilton. In fact, it would be him who comes up with the idea for the Bank of the United States to create a national currency, to create a strong central government. Uh, but he also believed that this government should be led by the wealthy and educated who could act on behalf of their less talented and gifted brethren. Thomas Jefferson strongly disagreed with this belief. In fact, he championed the anti-federalist ideal. So Hamilton might have been uh, a student of Plato who believed in the enlightened monarch or the enlightened despot that the wealthy and educated and talented top 10% must lead the rest of society. Jefferson believed that everyone should be responsible for their own fates and that this could best be accomplished through strong state and local governments that individual liberty perhaps was even more important than the stability of a strong national government. And so he believed that individual citizens' participation in a democracy was paramount to its success. Meanwhile, Alexander Hamilton has the support of the North. Many people in the North believed in this idea of a strong central government. Generally, people in the South and people in the Western territories were anti-federalists, supporting Jefferson's idea of a weaker central government and stronger state and local governments. Now, Hamilton's plan was to unite the country through a national currency, much like how the idea with the euro was to unite Western Europe through a strong central currency. 
And this was partly to affect the repayment of the U.S. national debt that had been incurred during the American Revolution. You see, the United States owed millions of dollars to foreign countries. In fact, it owed millions of dollars to private citizens, to Spain, to Britain, to France, but also to individual American citizens that had loaned the government money during the war. And so this debt had to be paid off. As we saw, in fact, there was a threat to the future of our country if we couldn't pay this debt. And so the plan was to pay the foreign debt by assuming it at the national level. You see, individual states had borrowed money separately. Virginia had borrowed money from France. North Carolina had borrowed money. Georgia had borrowed money. And so the nation was going to assume the debt of the states into a national bank, issuing a national currency. Interestingly, the spot he chose was just a few miles upstream from his home at Mount Vernon. Once the site had been chosen, a French engineer was hired to design the layout of the new city, which was to be based on a distinctive system of radiating boulevards. In 1791, Congress approved the creation of a privately owned bank, called the Bank of the United States, to handle the federal government's money. Alexander Hamilton had personally worked to have this bank created, for he believed it would help strengthen the government politically and economically. But Thomas Jefferson deeply opposed the bank, believing it to be a government-supported monopoly. Soon another issue arose that divided these two men, for Hamilton wanted the federal government to take an active role in promoting the development of American industry, and Jefferson did not. At this time, industrialization was just beginning to take hold in America. In fact, the factory in Rhode Island seen here, called Slater's Mill, opened right around the same time Hamilton was making his proposals to Congress. It was the first factory in the nation where water-powered machines were put to use in textile manufacturing. Machines like those in Slater's Mill had brought tremendous wealth to Great Britain and Hamilton wanted the same thing to happen in the United States. To achieve this goal, Hamilton wanted the federal government to make payments to people who open new factories and to enact protective tariffs, special taxes on imported goods. Under this plan, there would be an added incentive to build factories, and untaxed American manufactured goods would become more affordable than similar foreign products upon which taxes were paid. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were disgusted with Hamilton's plan, saying it represented unnecessary government interference. It was their belief that the federal government should play only a small role in the lives of the American people. Furthermore, Jefferson believed that massive industrialization would breed poverty and the growth of crowded, unhealthy cities. In contrast to Hamilton, Jefferson envisioned an American nation based on small, independent farms, places where a much more wholesome way of life could be pursued. Now, Hamilton's plan was for a national bank. And this national bank would be called the Bank of the United States. It would be funded by the federal government. It would be funded also by private investors. And like any other bank, it's going to take the money that people give to hold in trust, and it's going to invest that money. Um, yet there was a disagreement over congressional authority to establish a bank. Did Congress even have the right to do this? And um, so this began a, a serious debate over whether the, inter the Constitution should be interpreted literally as Jefferson believed. He believed there was no constitutional basis for a national bank. Um, or should it be interpreted loosely uh, using the uh, Ninth and Tenth Amendments that if the Constitution did not explicitly forbid it, 
uh, this would have been an implied power of Congress to create a national bank. And so we have this real debate. And so to win support for Hamilton's plan, he made a concession to the southern states. He said, look, if you will support this idea of a bank of the United States, we will move the nation's capital. It had been in Philadelphia. Um, after independence, it was moved to New York, New York City. And now to sell this idea to the southern states, the nation's capital was moved to Washington, D.C. And so Washington, D.C. was the site of a former swamp. It was nothing. There was no town there. It was just empty marshland. And so a grand city was planned. And it was decided that by 1800, our nation's capital would reside in Virginia at the District of Columbia. And as, and as America struggled to put together its new government, a revolution broke out in France in July of 1789. The repercussions of the French Revolution came to have a profound effect on United States foreign policy throughout the 1790s. In January of 1790, the U.S. Congress met here at the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia, the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. This building was to serve as the country's temporary capital while decisions about a new U.S. capital city were made. In 1790, one of the most urgent orders of business for the U.S. government was to come up with a way to repay long overdue debts incurred during the Revolutionary War, including such things as the back pay owed to soldiers. Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton worked out a controversial repayment plan to meet this goal. But certain congressmen would only accept his plan if he arranged to have the new U.S. capital city built in the southern part of the country. A location in Maryland, pictured here, was decided upon and Hamilton's repayment plan was passed. Then, not far from here along the banks of the Potomac River, President Washington selected the exact site where the federal city would someday stand. And so this division between a strong central government or a weak central government where essentially the state and local governments would do everything that the government would need to, need to do. Uh, Jefferson believed that really the only purpose of a central government was to protect the people and promote the rights of the individual. Uh, and that's it. As long as a government can rally a defense if we are attacked, and as long as the government can ensure that your individual rights are guaranteed, that's essentially all that Jefferson believed a federal government needed to do. And in fact, if you remember, the Anti-Federalists were not even really sold on the idea of a central government in the first place. Um, they were, in many cases, happy with remaining um, just a federation, just an alliance of different countries. And so this division uh, between the Anti-Federalist and the Federalist goes on to become the very first political parties in our country. You see, Washington ran under the only single party presidential election that we've ever had. He was a Federalist. In fact, he was running against other Federalists, uh, but he won pretty resoundingly. There was no other party until Jefferson went on to found the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, and opposing were, of course, the Federalists led by Alexander Hamilton. And this created the two-party system. But when the two-party system was created, President Washington warned that this would be dangerous to national unity and safety. In fact, he warned this could lead to a civil war if it continued. In the end, Jefferson's view prevailed in Congress, and Hamilton's plan for the industrialization of America was defeated. Differing views on government, such as those voiced over the issue of industrialization, were what gave rise to America's first political parties. 
and by the time the national elections were held in 1792, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and their supporters had formed the Federalist Party to promote their vision of a federal government that played a large and active role in American life. In opposition, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and their supporters had put together the Democratic Republican Party to promote the idea of a country with a small federal government that rarely interfered in the lives of its citizens. While the first political parties were forming, two new states were added to the United States. Vermont was added in 1791, followed a year later by Kentucky, the 15th state to join the Union. 1791 was also the year the Bill of Rights was ratified by the states. And thanks to this document, Americans were guaranteed the basic freedoms of religion, speech, right to free assembly, the right to keep and bear arms, the right to a speedy trial, and so forth. Now, of course, a new nation is going to have to deal with the question of taxes. Because big or small, no matter what the size of the federal government is, it's going to need funding to support it. And that's where we get our very first tax. And like so many of the tariffs that we saw before, it was a tariff. And the purpose of a tariff, a tax on imported goods, is to protect our nation's manufacturing base. Because for all those years that we were a colony, we were importing all the finished goods that we needed. And now that we are an independent country, uh, many American investors saw an opportunity to become wealthy by creating some of our very first factories. And that's excellent. However, these very first factories struggled to produce goods at a competing price from the British manufactured goods, from the French manufactured goods, because they had had factories for much longer. They could produce goods much cheaper. And so to ensure the success of these American industries, our government imposed a tariff a tax on imported goods to make the foreign goods more expensive so that Americans would purchase American-made goods. But also we needed a tax on American people. The tariff wasn't going to pay for everything. And so we created what is called an excise tax, a tax on a product's manufacture, sale, or distribution. Effectively, this was the first sales tax. So of course you go to the store, you see what's on the sticker, you want the item, you, you expect to pay what's on the sticker, and there's of course a tax. We're just used to it now. Well, that tax on a product sale, manufacture, or distribution was so upsetting to American people, in fact, so upsetting to a particular group of farmers, whiskey farmers, because to make corn, or to make rye, or to grow agricultural products, yielded a much greater profit if they turned those crops into alcohol. It was worth a lot more as alcohol than it was as corn, or as rye, or as barley, still today. And so these whiskey farmers actually staged a rebellion where in 1794 they refused to pay this tax. They got together in a big angry band of farmers, and when tax collectors would come, uh, they would beat them up and they would cover them in hot tar and they would dump feathers on them and they would send them back. And they threatened that if the U.S. government forced them to pay their taxes, they would secede. And so here we're already hearing secession and we just got started. And here already farmers are threatening to leave the country over the issue of taxation. And George Washington rallied a militia, personally led this militia over the Allegheny Mountains into Pennsylvania and put down the rebellion. And this demonstrated from our very first president that a strong central government could stop an insurrection. 